Well, howdy there, guys. This is your host, ID Jester. Today, we're going to have a special video and talk about something that I find very interesting. Something that I just came across recently, and I thought I would like to share my thoughts and feelings about it. Maybe even introduce an interesting story to many of you out there that have never heard of it before. It's about a maritime disaster that isn't talked about a lot. Something hidden unless you go looking for it. Why is there so little talked about, you might ask? Well, the answer to that question, in my opinion, you will see in a few minutes. If you're a fan of World War II and study its history and events, I hope you might find this episode interesting. Well, at least that's my goal. How many of you out there have watched the movie U571? I bet many of you have. It's a pretty good movie. It has an interesting plot and some good action scenes. Although it's a great movie, the reason I bring this up now is for context and what we're going to talk about later on. How many of you remember the scene towards the beginning of the movie where the German U-boat has surfaced and has come across the lifeboat in the water? They have a decision to make, what to do. Do they rescue the people or do they leave them to their own fate? You clearly see the lifeboat in the movie begging for mercy and asking for help. And the captain of the U-boat has to think about what to do. The captain of the U-boat has a tough decision to make and what he wants to do. And he explains in the movie that he has to follow orders given to him by the Fuhrer and not pick up any passengers or make any rescue attempts at all. As a moviegoer, we're all shocked and horrified by this proposal. They didn't help. They were told not to. And the movie makes these Germans into the so-called bad guys because of this decision. We are ingrained with these images time and time again, and so we believe them to be true. In this movie, it shows them as the Germans in World War II were horrible people, which did horrible things to everyone. But have you ever asked the question, why? Why were the Germans not told to pick up survivors? Why were the UO captains not allowed to help? If the German high command made specific directions to their U-boat captains not to do this, there must be a reason why. And I think when you look for the answer, it may shock many of you as it did me. The simple answer is the Laconia incident. I'm betting that many of you watching this video are unaware of this, and I'm also willing to bet that many of you don't know the story behind it. I know one thing. I didn't even hear about this until about a week ago, when I accidentally came across this. Life is funny sometimes. You're never sure where your decisions are going to take you. Sometimes just a simple decision can alter your life one way or another. You decide not to go to a party because you're not feeling well, and you miss the chance to meet your future wife. You decide to turn left instead of right and are hit by a car, breaking your leg, you lose your football scholarship and your NFL career. Or maybe it's just a random choice that you make. And that's what happened to me. After being challenged by my fellow host on the War Room live stream show to a co-op battle of the Hunters, which is a solitaire U-boat board game simulation, we all decided on the rules and decided to use the Type 9C submarines. And so... The challenge was on. Not having any detailed knowledge about this sub, and not wanting to look like an idiot in front of everyone, I did what everyone else would do. I looked it up on Wikipedia. And then came my random decision that took me down this path that led to this video today. Of all the ships to click on, I randomly chose U-506. There was no U-571 like the movies, as my first thought was to replay the movies out on the board game, which would be super cool. But besides that, nothing really struck out. I just randomly chose one. 506 seemed like a cool number, so that's why I chose it. During the live stream playthrough of The Hunters, I introduced my captain and ship to everyone read the description and events of what happened to this U-boat in real life. While going over my new U-boat I would be using for this co-op challenge, the description talked about the Laconia incident. 
but not having any knowledge of this event, I quickly crossed over it and moved on. It was only later, after finishing my first patrol, that I decided to find out more about this. It sounded interesting, and it was nothing I'd even heard of. So it intrigued me to find out more. And besides, what is someone who has asked me during the live stream about it? So I figured I should probably find out more just in case to cover all my bases. Before we actually talk about the incident, let me try and make another point about this that I find very interesting. How many of you out there know about the Titanic? I would say if we say that more than 90 to 95% of you out there have heard of the Titanic and you know the story behind it. If I was to ask you how many people died in this event, what would you say is the answer? I'll give you a second to think about it before I give you the answer. The answer is about 1,500 people died on the Titanic. What about the RMS Lusitania? How many of you out there know about this ship and the story behind it? I figure 60 to 70 percent at least know about it. Again, how many people died during its sinking? Again, I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. The answer is 1,198 lost souls in the sinking of the Lusitania. Now let me ask you another question, kind of important. If I ask you the same question about the RMS Laconia, I'm betting not too many people out there would know the answer. How many people died during its sinking? Again, I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. The answer might shock you as it did me. There was over 1,600 people that died, 1,658 people to be exact which means that this ship had a greater loss of life than both the Titanic and the Lusitania. If this is so terrible and such a horrific event, why don't we know more about it? Why is it talked about more? Why is information hidden away like a dark, dirty secret? Well, when you hear the story behind it, then you'll know why. On 12th of September, 1942, at 8.10 p.m., 130 miles north-northeast of Ascension Island, Laconia was hit in the starboard side by a torpedo fired by U-boat U-156. At the time of the attack, the Laconia was carrying 268 British soldiers, 160 Polish soldiers who were on guard, 80 civilians, and over 1,800 Italian prisoners of war. The captain of the Laconia, Captain Sharp, ordered the ship abandoned and the women, children, and injured taken into the lifeboats first. By this time, the ship's stern deck was awash. Some of the 32 lifeboats had been destroyed by the explosion. According to the Italian survivors, many of the POWs were left locked in the holds below deck, and those who escaped and tried to board lifeboats or life rafts were shot or bayoneted by British or Polish soldiers. While most British and Polish troops and crew survived, only 415 Italians were rescued out of the 1,809 who were aboard. At 9.11 p.m., Laconia sank, stern first, her bow rising to be vertical, with Sharp himself and many of the Italian prisoners still on board. The prospects of those who escaped the ship were only slightly better. Sharks were common in the area, and the lifeboats were adrift in the middle of the Atlantic with little hope for rescue. The captain of U-156 was Cop Lieutenant Werner Hartenstein. When servicing, he realized that over 1,500 people were in the water and immediately ordered a rescue operation to commence. Hartenstein would dispatch to the U-boat command in Germany asking for help. Admiral Karl Dunitz immediately ordered seven U-boats from the Wolfpack Ice Bar, which had been gathered to take part in a planned surprise attack on Cape Town to divert to the scene to pick up survivors. 
Hitler ordered the operation on Cape Town to commence, and therefore Admiral Eric Rader ordered Dunitz to disengage the ice bar boats, which included Hartenstein's U-156, and sent them to Cape Town as per the original plan. Rader then ordered U-506. Remember, this is my U-boat, which I randomly selected, and hence my connection to this whole event. U-506 was led by Cap Lieutenant Eric Vunderman and U-507 under Corver Vonet Capitan Harro Schultz and the Italian sub Commandante Capellini to intercept Hartenstein to take on its survivors and then to proceed to the Laconia site and rescue any Italians that can be found. Rader also requested the Vici France to send warships to collect the Italian survivors from the three submarines. In this actual photo, you can see U-156 in the foreground and U-507 in the background. U-516 was soon crammed above and below deck with nearly 200 survivors, including five women, and had another 200 in tow aboard four lifeboats. At 6 a.m. on the 13th of September, Hartenstein broadcast a message on the 25-meter, 82-foot band in English, not in code, to all shipping in the area, giving his position, requesting assistance with the rescue efforts, and promised not to attack. It read, If any ship will assist the shipwrecked Laconia crew, I will not attack her provided I am not attacked myself by ship or air force. I picked up 193 men, 4 degrees minus 53 degrees south, 11 degrees minus 20 degrees, 26 degrees west. German submarine. U-156 remained on the surface at the scene for the next two and a half days. At 11.30 a.m. on the 15th of September, she was joined by U-506, and a few hours later by both U-507 and the Commandante Capolini, the four submarines with lifeboats in tow and hundreds of survivors standing on their decks headed for the African coastline and a rendezvous with Vichy French surface warships. During the night, U-156 became separated from the other submarines. The next morning, on September 16th, at 11.25 a.m., U-156 was spotted by an American B-24 Liberator bomber flying from a secret airbase on Ascension Island. The submarine was traveling with a Red Cross flag draped across her gun deck. Hartenstein signaled to the pilot in both Morse code and English, requesting assistance. The British officer aboard the sub also messaged the aircraft, RAF officer, speaking from German submarine. The Konya survivors on board, soldiers, civilians, women, and children. Lieutenant James D. Harden of the U.S. Army Air Force did not respond to the message. Turning away, he notified his base of the situation. The senior officer on duty that day, Captain Robert C. Richardson III, who claimed that he didn't know this was a Red Cross-sanctioned German rescue operation, ordered the B-24 to sink the sub. Hardin then flew back to the scene of the rescue effort and at 12.32 p.m. attacked with bombs and depth charges. One landed among the lifeboats in tow behind U-156, killing dozens of survivors, while others straddled the submarine itself, causing only minor damage. Hartenstein had no other choice but to cast adrift those lifeboats still afloat and ordered the survivors on his deck into the water. The submarine submerged slowly to give those still on deck a chance to get in the water and escape. According to Hardin's report, he made four runs at the submarine. On the first three, the depth charges and bombs failed to release. On the fourth, he dropped two bombs. The crew of the Liberator were later, were later awarded medals for the alleged sinking of U-156, when they in fact only sunk two lifeboats. Ignoring Commander 
Hartenstein requests that the lifeboats stay in the area to be rescued by the Vichy French, two lifeboats decided to head for the coast of Africa. One, which began the journey with 68 people on board, reached the African coast 27 days later with only 16 survivors. The other was rescued by a British trawler after 40 days at sea. Only four of its 52 occupants were still alive. Five B-25s from Ascension's permanent squadron and Hardin's B-24 continued to search for submarines from dusk till dawn. On 17th of September, one B-25 sighted the Coney's lifeboats and informed Emperor Haven of their position. Hardin's B-24 sighted U-506, which had 151 survivors on board, including nine women and children, and attacked. On the first two runs, the bombs failed to drop. U-506 crash dive. And on the second run, the B-24 dropped two 500-pound bombs and two 350-pound depth charges, but luckily they caused no damage. The French cruiser Glory picked up 52 survivors, all of them British, then met with the sloop Anamite, and both ships met up with U-507 and 506 at a rendezvous point at a little after 2 p.m. on the 17th of September. With the exception of two British officers kept on board U-507, the survivors were all transferred to the rescue ships. Lorraine sailed, sailed off on her own and within four hours rescued another 11 lifeboats. In told, in the rescue operations, 373 Italians, 70 Poles, 597 British, who included 48 women and children, were saved. Upon their arrival on September 25th, Colonel Baldwin, on behalf of all of the British survivors, presented the captain of the Italian sub, Capolini, with a letter that read as follows. We, the undersigned officers in His Majesty's Navy, Army and Air Force, and of the Merchant Navy, and also on behalf of the Polish Detachment, the prisoners of war, the men, the women, the children, wish to express to you our deepest and sincere gratitude for all that you have done, at the cost of very great difficulties to your ship and your crew, in welcoming us, the survivors of His Majesty's transport ship, the Laconia. Of Laconia's original complement of 2,732 people, only 1,113 survived. Of these 1,619 who died, 1,420 were Italian prisoners of war. Doris Hawkins, a missionary nurse, survived the Laconia incident and spent 27 days adrift in a lifeboat 9, finally coming ashore on the coast of Liberia. She was returning to England after five years in Palestine with her 14-month-old baby, Sally K. Redman, who was lost at sea as they were transferring into the lifeboat. Doris Hawkins wrote a pamphlet entitled Atlantic Torpedo after her eventual return to England, published by Victor Galanzik in 1943. In it, she writes of the moments when Sally was lost. We found ourselves on top of the arms and legs of a panic-stricken mass of humanity. The lifeboats, filled to capacity with men, women, and children, was leaking badly and rapidly filling with water. At the same time, it was crushing against the side of the ship. Just as Sally was passed over me, the boat flipped completely and capsized, flinging us all into the water. I lost her. I didn't even hear her cry. I am sure that God took her away immediately to be with himself without suffering. I never saw her again. Doris Hawkins was one of 16 survivors out of the 69 that started in lifeboat when it was cast adrift from the U-boat which came under attack. The Laconia incident had far-reaching consequences. Up until that point, 
It was common for U-boat to assist torpedo survivors with food, with water, with ample medical care for the wounded, and normally a compass bearing to the nearest landmass. It was extremely rare for survivors to be brought on board as space on a U-boat was barely enough for its own crew. On 17th of September, 1942, in response to the incident, Admiral Carl Dunitz issued an order named Triton Null, later which became later known as the Laconia Order. In it, Dunitz prohibited U-boat crews from attempting rescue. Survivors must be left at sea. Hence, our discussion in the beginning of this video and why. Why were the Germans not told to pick up survivors? While American television and movie continue to spread this notion to the masses, the Germans wouldn't help those in need because they were all cruel, hateful individuals and nothing but evil intentions. But when you find out the truth behind this, you find out why it's kept a dark secret, why it's hidden away from the masses and not discusses. Americans see themselves as the good guys, the ones that saved the world. They've been told that over and over again in the movies, on television, and the stories they read. Americans don't want to believe they did anything wrong. They don't want to learn about the situation that they turned out to be the ones who did the wrong. Now, does, the excuse for, does this excuse what the Germans did in World War II? Of course not. Not even close. I am sure there are many, many stories to be told from both sides, both for the good and for the bad. War is hell. We know this. Nothing good can come from it. But when a small moment of humanity is undone by the careless whims of those without the foresight to see the big picture, then this is something that needs to be taught. This is something that needs to be learned so we don't make the mistakes of the past and not to repeat it again in the future. The Naval War College Journal, International Law Studies, covers interpretations of international law during armed conflicts and how these laws are applied to each party. In Volume 65, Chapter 3, The Laws of Naval Operation, the Laconia Incident is examined in the context of the application of international law on World War II submarine warfare. Its conclusion, the persons who issued the order to attack and the aircraft commander who carried it out are both prima facie guilty of a war crime. The conduct of the aircraft commander appears to be entirely inexcusable since it has been observed of the rescue operation. During the time that they are that they engaged in such an operation, enemy sumps are no longer lawful objects of attack. The fact that the U.S. Army Air Force took no action to investigate this incident and that no trials took place under the then effective domestic criminal code, the Articles of War, is a serious reflection on the entire chain of military command. For those of you that are unfamiliar with this incident and you find it interesting enough and want to find out more information, I can share what I've learned about it during my short time of study with it. In 2011, the BBC in the United Kingdom's broadcast The Sinking of the Laconia, a two-part dramatization of the sinking of Laconia. You can find this mini-series on either YouTube or order it on Amazon. Also, The Sinking of the RMS Laconia is featured in the animal planet show River Monsters in an episode titled Killers from the Abyss which investigates the shark attacks on the survivors of the sinking ship. If you check out Amazon, you can find a few books on the subject, including one called One Common Enemy, The Laconia Incident, a Survivor's Memoirs by Jim McLaughlin. To be honest, there's less than a half a dozen books on the subject at most, which is a shame, as this story shouldn't be left in the dark. When you compare that to the 75 pages of stuff when you do a search for Titanic, it really shows the discrepancy between these two stories. Do we really need a book on every metal that was used on the Titanic? Not really. This discrepancy might even make you think to yourself why. 
Why is one story such a major part of our history now compared to the other? A ship is built to never sink. It goes out, hits an iceberg, and sinks. Story over. Do we really need 75 pages of stuff on Amazon about this event? The other story, a ship is torpedoed by a U-boat, which then proceeds to try and rescue its survivors, calling for help not only from its allies, but as well as its enemies. The fight for survival on board the ship, which has more people on it than the Titanic. The discussion people make the decisions people have to make about either jumping into the shark-filled waters or risking death by climbing aboard an already overfilled lifeboat. The U-boat, which come to their rescue, are then bombed by depth charges by the United States Army Air Force on multiple occasions, even though they're in the middle of a rescue operation. As we talked about earlier in this video, the decisions that people had to make were truly a life and death decision. And in the end, over 1,600 of them died. Someone had to tell the story. Someone had to talk about the events. Someone had to bring it to everyone's attention. As far as the outcome for the participant in this event, U-516, during his fifth patrol, on 8th of March, 1943, Hartenstein and the entire crew of U-156 were killed in action by depth charges dropped from a Catalina aircraft east of Barbados. The Catalina dropped four Mark 44 Topix water bombs at 1315 from an altitude of 75 to 100 feet, which straddled the U-156. Two bombs were observed hitting the water 10 feet to 15 feet starboard and just aft of U-156 lifting it out of the water and breaking it in two, followed by a massive explosion. As far as my connection to this event, U-506 and its captain Eric Venderman, what happened to them? Well, U-506 was credited with sinking 13 ships for a total of 61,000 tons and further damaging three more ships. Eric Venderman would go on to be a recipient of the Knight Cross of the Iron Cross, which is issued for extreme battlefield bravery or successful military leadership. Finally, 14th of July, 1943, six days into his fifth patrol, Vinderman was killed along with all but six of his crew when U-506 was sunk in the Atlantic west of Virgo, Spain by depth charges dropped from a B-24 Liberator by the United States Air Force, 1st Anti-Submarine Squadron. I may or may not win our co-op challenge when playing the Hunters. At this point, I don't really care, because the choices that were made and the decisions that led me down this road to this incredible story, I feel like I'm already a winner. I feel as though the pieces on the board have more meaning now, that the decisions that I have to make have consequences, and that the life and death struggle that actual people endure now have much more meaning to me. Thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.